Hi there. So I'm Dick Seitz, and I've been doing this sort of thing for 50-odd years. And uh, the thing I like to do is to understand why things are slow and to build tools to get the data to explain why things are slow. Is it possible for the people in the room if we can lower the front lights? I pushed the wrong button. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, a problem that I've dealt with working at places like Google, uh, a solution that I, I bring to the table, and then give a whole bunch of examples. And then at the end, uh, talk about contributions and take a bunch of questions. So this is the problem. I want to understand why in complex real-time software, this is user-facing data center software, uh, real-time controls for airplanes and cars, uh, those sorts of things. Why in complex real-time software that it's sometimes slow, sometimes not slow? If you're doing transactions and you look at some measurement of how long each transaction takes, you find over on the lower left um, that there's often a bunch of fast or normal speed transactions and then there's some slow ones. In this particular picture, there's one very slow one at the bottom. This is sorted by uh, duration and a bunch of slow ones. And you can see there's an obvious step function, cliffs of these are really slow, these are, these are medium fast, these are really fast. Or if you're doing real-time controls of uh, you know, ailerons or, or steering wheels or whatever, you may have periodic uh, execution tasks that run like once every 30th of a second or something. And if one task runs too long, then the following task doesn't run on time. And things happen like you drop a video frame and you're going down the road at 100 feet per second or you know, something absurd. Um, this is a picture from a bunch of uh, Google search transactions showing just one uh, remote procedure call search that starts up at the top and then it does a fan out, in this case of uh, 93, they're not all shown, 93 calls to other machines saying, please do a piece of the search and then get the results back and, and uh, rank them and sort them and, and then display 10 answers. And what you see over here, this time diagram that goes 160 milliseconds is some stuff happens at the beginning and then these, these parallel calls go out and they come back at different times. And because you're waiting for all the answers, the last guy determines the response time. And so I'm the person interested in, in these hindered transactions of why are they slow? <coughs> because my experience has been that if you, can, if you understand why, why it's slow, there's almost always something you can do to fix it in about 20 minutes, even if it took you three months to figure out why it's slow. It's very gratifying. Um, here's some um, disk server uh, measurements of times to go read uh, 64K or something off of a disk in a disk server farm around a, a data center room. And you get the usual uh, spikes at zero milliseconds of uh, hitting on, on data that's in the in-RAM cache. You get a spike around three milliseconds of hitting on data that's in the drive, in the drive's track buffer. And then you get the hump around 15 milliseconds of actually seeking a reading. Then you get this long tail, the 99th percentile of this particular 24-hour measurement, 696 milliseconds. While well, the average was back there, the median actually was back there at 26. So I'm interested in, in, in understanding the long ones. Traditional performance tools as an industry are incapable of explaining these slow things. Uh, counters, you know, a number of things that happen, performance counters, things like that. Um, they only tell you about average behavior. They, they don't distinguish the good cases from the bad cases. They just say, here's what happened overall, over the last 10 minutes or whatever. Uh, profiles, where you sample the PC and, and read them, um, see what's doing. Again, just average together the good cases and the bad cases. And, and in doing so, they drop the signal-to-noise ratio about the bad cases by a factor of 100. <laughs> Um, they're also blind, CPU profiles are completely blind to not executing. And an awful lot of uh, <coughs> transaction work involves waiting for something else. And if the picture in your head of what you're waiting for and the reality of what you're waiting for are totally different, you can't explain why it's so slow because it's waiting on something you don't, you don't understand. 
And traditional traces, where you trace everything that's happening, uh, are much too slow to use in like live data centers or in live vehicle control. So what we've done as an industry is we see something that's slow, some performance problem, you look at it for a while, you study the circumstances a bit, and then you guess. And you try some experiment to see if the guess is right, and then you guess again. And my observation is that programmers are singularly inept at guessing how the picture in their heads is different from reality. So I brought forward a solution. Uh, first did this at Google more than 10 years ago, uh, but the version I'm displaying today uh, I built from scratch without any, any Google code after I left. Um, if you have a bunch of transactions or events or video frames or whatever, and you don't know ahead of time which ones are going to be slow, you need to watch everything that's happening for a while until you get some bad ones so you can go figure out what they are like and how they're different from the good ones. And so I'm a strong believer with this level of problem that all you can do is trace everything. Sampling techniques, you only sample because the overhead of your tool is too high to use all the time, so you can only use it a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. When you're sampling, you, you inevitably miss what the real problem is. <clears throat> um, so KU Trace is this tool that I've built that traces all the transitions between kernel mode and user mode. So every system call, system return, interrupt, interrupt, return, uh, fault, fault return, every context switch. That's all it does. The only reason it's fast is it's not ambitious. There are no options. There are no controls. There's no subsetting. And um, the current version, the overhead is a quarter of a percent. If you're getting 200,000 events per second, 200,000 transitions between user mode and kernel mode per core. So if you're running a 32-core machine, you're getting 32 times 2,000 events per second, but the total overhead is still a quarter of a percent. So it's like 30 times faster than F-Trace. You cannot use F-Trace in a real live data center environment because it slows everything down. So the point by just tracing the transitions is time is going on. Everything is happening. The transitions tell you right after each transition what is executing. This system call is executing. This interrupt handler is executing. This user program by process ID is executing. There's nothing missing because I'm just recording the transitions. I'm not recording durations. And so every CPU core if it transitions into uh, a syscall for something, it's in that doing something until eventually there's a transition out. And this idea that there's nothing missing turns out to be really important because then you can say definitively, X didn't happen. For instance, if you guess, oh, this program is slow because it's waiting on the disk, and you take some you know, minute-long trace and you look at it and there are no disk interrupts, you can say, it is not waiting on the disk. Okay. If you're doing sampling, you can't say that. All you can say is, when I looked, I didn't see any disk activity. But I didn't look very often. Okay. The tracing, since it's showing you everything that's happening on all of the CPU cores, gives you the reason that everything is slow. There's nothing missing. There's no, there's no magic from the outside world that suddenly makes a program execute differently. There's something that, that's going on on the machine in the trace that makes it execute differently. So why kernel user transitions? Um, tracing more events than that, for instance, every procedure entry and exit in user code and in kernel code is just too slow. I, I could not make, I've tried, I can't make a tool that does that with 1% overhead. 14%, yes, 1%, no. <clears throat> tracing fewer events like just context which you tell you're running this program, you're running that program, you're running this third program, um, that has even lower overhead, but it doesn't give you enough information to explain why, why things are slow. So this is the just right part. I, I can assign every nanosecond for every CPU core what it's doing with very tiny overhead. 
Everything else is post-processing. So this is the mechanism. This is implemented in Linux. There's over on the, the far left some user code. There's the Linux kernel. There's a handful of patches. The current patches are in 19 files only because the interrupt handling in x86 Linux is scattered across half a dozen different files. Uh, timer interrupts are different from the, than uh, regular interrupts, and there's handfuls of special cases. Um, and the patches are on the order of two lines per file, saying trace the beginning of a system call, trace the end of a system call. That's the, that's the set of patches in the, in the uh, syscall entry. There's trace interrupt handling, end of tracing interrupt handling. Um, those hooks, which are just uh, one-line macros that say, if tracing is on, do this call, uh, go to a loadable module. And if the module isn't loaded, the tracing isn't on. And that's that. <coughs> um, there's a user mode control program that can uh, turn the tracing on and off and dump the trace file. The trace goes into <coughs> a raw uh, reserved buffer in the kernel anywhere from a megabyte to, uh, to 10 gigabytes or whatever you want. <clears throat> and then after that's read out and put on disk, you post-process and think about it for a while. <clears throat> so this is the entire patch for syscall. There's the extra line that's the ktrace1 macro that says uh, trace the beginning of a system call. Uh, turns out there's a mapping of the system call number that has to do with uh, backwards compatibility with 32-bit system calls, and the register that's passed in is the low order, the first argument of the system call, which turns out to be really useful information. It's like which file is getting touched or which file ID. And um, the thing being passed for the return is the return value, uh, which could be one of uh, several dozen error codes, or it could be things like the number of bytes read. And having that number turns out to be really useful in, in, in uh, looking carefully at what's going on. Then there's this post-processing chain of a few programs that takes a raw trace file, turns it into individual events, uh, just long text files, uh, and then there's an event span program that takes all the transitions and turns them into time spans. And so its output is a bunch of back-to-back uh, -back time spans that cover every CPU core, every nanosecond of the entire trace. And the traces typically run uh, 30 seconds to a couple minutes. I haven't found a uh, need to do more than about two minutes. You learn an awful lot in two minutes. But there is a flight recorder uh, uh, version where you can just trace continuously until you stop, and then you get to see the previous 30 seconds to two minutes. Um, then there's finally a little bit that takes the JSON and turns it into an HTML file. And I'll show you output from a bunch of those. Uh, so I'm going to go through four sets of examples. First one is Hello World. So this is uh, Hello World. I simply added to it two lines, one of which is a call to, this is user code, a ktrace library that says add a marker to the trace that says hello, and after the printf, add a marker to the trace that says uh, slash hello. I just picked the slash convention for uh, like HTML tags. And then you compile it and run it. And I'll show you a bunch of diagrams with this notation. The, these are all going to be timelines per CPU core. And the thin black lines are the idle task. The tall line, colored lines are kernel mode execution, and the half height ones are user mode. And the middle colors just distinguish uh, by process ID, mod 15 or mod 17, which uh, process is running, or by uh, syscall number mod 15 and mod 17, uh, you get different colors or different syscalls, that kind of thing. Um, for the kernel stuff, things that are faults have uh, pink edges, and things that are interrupt handling have uh, blue edges, and things that are system calls have green edges, so you can distinguish. Uh, and those are the only three ways of getting from user mode to kernel mode. There's nothing else. You get a two-bit ECC error in memory. There's a machine error interrupt. And so you're doing interrupt handling. So this is a trace of hello world user mode only. 
Looking at the 40 milliseconds, here's the flag at the beginning of the main program. Here's the flag it put into the trace at the end of the main program. And it just says, I'm executing this Hello World program. The colors are whatever the process ID was for Hello World. And there's some gaps, as you'll see, in this whole thing. It's 40 microseconds. So not very interesting. Most user mode tools in this industry, that's all you get to see. And that almost never explains why complex software is slow. So here's the same picture with all the, the, the rest of the user mode execution. The previous uh, picture was this part over here on the right in the dotted lines. All of this other stuff is getting Hello World started. In fact, it actually started over here on CPU 3, ran for a little while, and got migrated over to CPU 1, and then ran for a while, and then finally got to the first line of main. This is all setting up stacks and opening sys out and all these things. And uh, back here, it's like reading it off disk. In this case, reading it from the file cache in memory because I read this program twice and I traced the second one. Okay, but here's what's in the gaps. It's all the user, all the uh, kernel mode code. And most of which are page faults, it turns out. And that's not a complete picture at all of what's going on because here's all of the other stuff going on on the same machine at the same time, all the other programs. Okay. And if you have interference with your program from other programs, you only can learn what's going on if you can see the other programs. Okay, so this is now four CPU cores, and we get to see everything that's going on in every one of them. It turns out CPU zero is only doing the idle job. There's a timer interrupt, interrupts way off to the right and left. But this is the complete picture of what's going on, including on CPU 2, this happened to have a program that's just running continuously beating memory to death. And possibly, and in fact, would be slowing down something on CPU 0 if there were something running there. And you will see that in example 4. So that's just to calibrate, yes? Beth, you just said the critical word, calibrate. Yeah. And if you go back to your screen, that's an example of your source code initially. Uh -huh. Sure. So let me, let me repeat the question. What's the overhead of putting these marks in? That's not the question. Oh. The question my question was, did you run this code here minus the very simple printf? I oh, oh minus the hello world printf. Yeah, you know, no. The no. I, I, but that's fine. I, I will talk about the overhead of the tracing and why it's so small, and the, including the overhead of those two calls. On the, slide 21, how did you tell that the program switched from CPU 3 to 1? Uh, because the top row that's all white is CPU 0, the middle row is CPU 1 that has some stuff on it, CPU 2 is all white, and CPU 3 down at the bottom is executing. But you showed on the next slide or so that there was also other stuff going. Oh, yeah. Uh, because process 55 was running on CPU 3, and then later process 55 was running on CPU 1. Okay. I'm tracing all the context switches. That's part of what happens inside of the kernel scheduler when you're, when you're leaving a, an interrupt or something. Not to the process of course, that's, that's where the colors are coming from. If you don't record the process number, you have no idea what's running. Okay. Just like if you don't record the syscall number, you have no idea which system call is running. <laughs> yeah, go on. Quick, two questions, then I have to keep going. I'm getting to that, uh, but, I, but not in this example. Um, they're doing things like setting up the stack. They're all copy on writes of uh, stuff that's allocated, and, and all the page table entries point to the all zero page, and then the first time you write to it, you take a page fault, and inside the page all routine, it says, oh, this is just a starting up a copy. It. Go find a real page, copy all the zeros into it slowly. Nobody optimized the, am I copying from the all zero page? Just store zero, stop reading the zeros. And then go back, and then the page fault doesn't happen because you made the PT writable pointing to the real page, and then it goes on and writes the stack for the first time. So that's uh, sort of your quick calibration. So I took some traces of the Linux schedulers. There's the completely fair scheduler, CFS, which is the default, and it simply runs each task at equal speed, 
and each task is supposed to get, if you have five CPUs and, and 50 tasks, each task is supposed to get one-tenth of the CPU times. The first-in, first-out scheduler is intended to be a real-time scheduler. The, the first program that arrives runs to completion, and then the next thing runs, and then the next thing first-in, first-out. Round Robin says, oh, well, that's very good, but if the first thing blocks, we'll go put it at the end of the queue so that the, all the other things can run. And then later, these were layered with, oh, if it's run for a while, uh, maybe we should go ahead and, and preempt it and let one of the other things run. Uh, and in particular, uh, if you're running a high-priority real-time task that's in a tight loop by common mistake, um, you'd like to be able to get Control-C and things like that to actually get some cycles so you can kill it. So this preemption tends to be useful. So I simply ran the, the three different schedulers with a little program that, that spawns one task, and then when that finishes, spawns two, and when those finish, spawns three, up through 12. And each of those tasks simply does a bunch of checksumming of a 240 kilobyte array uh, chosen to mostly fill up the L2 cache. And here's what they look like. We have in time, I, I've sorted now by process ID instead of sorting by CPU number. Same data, different sort. Really useful. So by process ID, there's bash is up at the top here. And it spawns one process and it runs for about a second and, and it's done and then the uh, top level program uh, spawns two processes, and then when they finish, it spawns three, and then four, and down here, it spawns 12. You'll notice it gets long, uh, longer and longer because there's only four CPUs. So after four CPUs, the total runtime starts getting longer because they have to actually swap off. Okay, I'm going to look at the trace of seven of these. So here's what happens with this completely fair scheduler. There's seven lines here showing seven different processes and when they're running. So there's a context here, switch here that starts this process, and 12 milliseconds later, there's a context switch that stops it and starts some other process. First thing I noticed is process seven stopped back here, and process one stopped way out there. There's a 30% variability in how long it took these seven processes, each of these seven processes, to run. This is not completely fair. You also notice that there's unpredictably these uh, stretches where some processes run for a lot more than 12 milliseconds and they don't get switched out. The first in, first out scheduler starts this guy and it doesn't run very much. Uh, that's the first one launched. The second one launched runs. So the first three launched actually take a long time. The fourth one uh, it's a shorter time, and there's an 18% variance there. And the round robin one looks pretty similar to the first in, first out, since it's only a small modification, and there's a 22% variance. So I'd like to explain, be able to explain these long ones. Why aren't they all fast? So we get to look at a little more what's going on. This is now in detail. The last picture was 2.2 seconds across the page, across the screen. This is 120 milliseconds of just the beginning of launching seven, and then one of the launch threads runs, another one runs, and after 12 milliseconds, context switches, context switches back, context switches, context switches back. And across this, if you look a little further out, there's all seven of them swapping around periodically. Over here on the right, there's starting everything up. And you may notice these dotted lines of connecting making something runnable with where it actually runs and how much later it actually runs. So I'm going to zoom in on the startup. The startup has two views. The top four lines are the CPUs, and the bottom uh, seven, eight lines are the individual processes. Again, the same data. So, so this, this lump of execution on CPU zero is, is exactly that lump of execution for the bash process. This lump over here is exactly uh, there's two lumps there, is that one and that one. So what we see at the beginning is, with these four arrows, is Bash does four clone calls to start up the other threads. But the other three clone calls happen later. <coughs> Not in the picture in your head. The reason they happen later is these three threads that are started actually start, and Bash gets context switched out because they're all running at equal priority. <coughs> 
And it finally gets back in here and gets another thread going. And then it gets contest switched out. And it finally gets back in here and gets another thread going. So this last guy starts uh, what, 400 mi microseconds later than the first one. This is just an example of the kind of dynamics that sometimes there, there are hundreds of, and thousands of microseconds and dozens of milliseconds. There's several more things going on here. So these threads that are cloned, they don't actually start immediately, but they start fairly soon. And the first thing they do is they stop executing. And they don't do real execution until out here a ways. So I'm going to zoom in a bit more. I have to explain the notation first. These dotted lines for the process lines are showing what it's waiting for when it's not running. So we trace that this little piece of code runs, and then it blocks. Technically, it goes into the kernel scheduler, it goes out of the kernel scheduler, it goes into idle. After a while, it comes out of idle by there's an interrupt that happens or the scheduler gets triggered due to a cross-processor interrupt from an interrupt routine on a different core or whatever, and the scheduler says, oh, I can run this guy again. And in between, um, depending on what is going on, there may be some other process that sets the runnable bit for the one that's going to start up, saying you can now run. And so I simply look at which piece of the kernel is executing when the set runnable bit is done. If it's executing inside of the disk interrupt handler, then I say, ah, it was waiting on disk. If it's executing inside the network receiver transmit interrupt handler when it says make that other thread runnable, I say, ah, that thread was waiting on the network. If a thread is made runnable but doesn't run, because it doesn't have a CPU assigned to it, because, for instance, the CPUs are all busy doing other stuff, then it's waiting for a CPU, and I mark that in the post-processing. It's all done in the post-processing. It's not done by adding extra trace entries. Those entries are already there, other than the make runnable entry, which turned out to be a key ah. thing. Waiting for memory is the page fault? Waiting for memory is the page fault. Yeah, so what's going on here? I think I have this on the next slide. Yeah, so this is an expansion of that. So what's happening up here is CPU zero up here on the left clones these other threads with lazy sharing of the pages. Remember, these are child processes sharing memory with the parent process. So the first thing that happens in one of these child processes is it starts executing, and bam, it gets a page fault on this first copy and write. Except that because of the lazy, the bash hasn't actually finished setting up the sharing, uh, but it has, it has a lock. So this first page fault has to wait for bash to run and get its mprotect system call together and actually get things going. And in the middle of mprotect, that wakes up the guy that, that back here was waiting to say, okay, you, you can go finish your page fault now. And this bouncing back and forth happens until everybody has their uh, memory PTE set up properly to share, and, and, then, and then you're off and running. So there's a lot of bouncing back and forth to get started, but you, you, you expect that doesn't matter very much. Uh, but you would be wrong because you might find in some programs that you're in this kind of behavior all the time, but you don't know it. And, of course, you notice there's a lot of idle time and there's these sine waves that we'll get to. But things aren't executing very much. So, in fact, there's 382 microseconds of idle time. Uh, this 320 is, is elapsed time, so there's four times that total time to be accounted for. 540 microseconds are the sine waves that we'll get to. If we could get rid of those two, this whole thing, this whole startup would be three times faster. So we'll get back to that a bit. I have to talk about power saving. On modern processors running on batteries, yes? What would happen if you disable copy on write and said give it page write or play? What, what would happen if you if you didn't do uh, lazy copy on write to do pages if somebody says, oh, malloc a megabyte, and you simply allocate a megabyte of real memory space and you fill all megabyte with zero. What happens is everything gets really slow because there's lots of stuff that allocates much more space than it ever intends to use. And you would actually allocate it as real memory. And you would, you would spend dozens and dozens of microseconds zeroing it. 
and nobody's ever going to touch it. FreeBSD did that for a while and took it out. Yeah. And what happens if you make Bash somehow more privileged in terms of its resources so that it runs in a way? Uh, okay. So, so my goal here is not to explain how to fix all these things. My goal is to show them to you so you can think about them. And you will all have good ideas, and they will all take 20 minutes to fix. All right? But I need to show you some more examples. So the first uh, drill down a little bit is modern CPUs to save power um, go into deep sleep states, at which time they lower the clock rate and the voltage in stair steps and coordinated because if you lower the voltage really quickly and you leave the clock rate too high that uh, everything craps out, so you have to lower the clock rate first and then the voltage and then the clock rate and voltage. Okay, meanwhile, after a while, if you're being serious about saving power, you turn off a complete core. To do that, you have to turn off its caches. Okay, to do that, you have to write back everything that's in the cache out here and you have to reload it back here because in between, it's off. It's not, it's not paying attention to who else is writing and everything else. Okay, and, and so when it comes back up, not only does it have no concept of who else has data where, it doesn't even have good parity in any of the cache lines, or perhaps in half of them, because you randomly power up and say, ah. Oh. So the first thing that happens in here is writing good parity cache lines, which for a 256K second level cache takes a little while, several microseconds. So this is the going off. This is how it's triggered. This is Intel x86, Intel and AMD, 64-bit. Um, There's an M-weight instruction that gives a hint to the processor. It says, oh, you could go into C6 deep sleep now. Okay. In this trace, this M-weight was issued 800-odd nanoseconds after entering idle. The idle loop actually loops for a little while, and it says, oh, it's time to do an M-weight, and shuts down the CPU core, 870 nanoseconds. At the other end, there's eventually some interrupt that gets directed to that CPU. And the hardware says, ah, can't execute instructions. The iCache is off. The secondary cache is off. The, the clocks are way low. So, so get, get the ball rolling again, and that takes a while. 30 microseconds. This matters if you care about interrupt latency in some like remote DMA kind of uh, network thing and you're expecting microsecond turnaround and you are running on a machine that's otherwise, on a CPU core that's otherwise idle, bam, you're doing 30 microseconds all the time. So that's what's going on in this, uh, this little game here. These are all, this guy runs for a little bit, goes into idle, turns off the core. The next thing that happens is somebody else says, oh, you can run after all, and it takes a long time to come back up, and then it runs for a little bit and then turns off the core. So in fact, in this particular trace, if the M weights weren't there and uh, you just bounce back and forth, this whole thing would be three times faster. You'd never go into C6, you wouldn't spend a long time. So this is the design flaw. If it takes time T to come out of some weird state, you should wait time t before you go in, hoping that you don't have to go in. Okay. If you do that, you're no worse than a factor of two off from the optimal algorithm if you knew what the future held. So going in in less than a microsecond to something that's going to cost you 30 microseconds to come out is just a bad design flaw, but one that you cannot see and no one has seen until this stuff started happening. Uh, I have, as it turns out, at every timer tick, I also record the PC value of the thing that was interrupted. See, so uh, I just added this last week. So you can get standard PC sample profiles of what's going on inside of user code that's not doing any transitions to kernel code. It's just CPU bound. And I just wanted to, to show you on the scale. This, this is that startup stuff we were looking at expanded. Here's a four millisecond sample, here's a four millisecond sample, here's another one. So there's 20 of them on, on this screen across the four CPUs. The KU trace has 2,100 samples o over that section of the trace. So 100 times more information. Yes? So you're using this to find um, uh, situations where, where you're, you're, you're giving examples where, there, where the uh, uh, CPU is turning off and it's a bad idea. No, 
turning off too soon is a bad idea. Turn, if you're going to be off for four milliseconds, by all means, turn off. Well, it's a good decision to turn off if you have a cell phone because you care about the battery and you don't care about the performance. It's a bad decision to turn off if you don't need to turn off because you're about to do something just a few microseconds later. And that happens a lot in data centers. And until we could see it, until I added the sine waves, we didn't know what was happening. So here's uh, example three. This is a client and a server, so machine A sends some requests to machine B. Machine B is running this toy in-memory database. It's, it's, a, it's a C++ map, key and value. And machine A, 100 times, says, go write this megabyte into the database. Sometimes later there's going to be a million reads or something, but right now it's just the writes. Um, both the client and the server in this setup report about 85 transactions per second, or about 11.5 milliseconds per transaction. The server over here, B, reports that each transaction actually only takes one and a half milliseconds of user time, <coughs> user CPU time, and only about 2.8 milliseconds of elapsed time. And the server reports that it's 97% idle. You might want to get more than 85 transactions per second if you could understand why it's so slow. So here's a little trace. This is uh, a few seconds across. No, it's, it's less than a few seconds. And it might be a second, it's a second across. And we have these little flags because I put that into the toy program so we could see what was happening. But, but the, all of the annotation stuff is optional. So this says write, write, write. And so these are the beginnings of the bunch of writes. And some of them, it's running on CPU 1. Some of them, it's running on three, CPU 3. Some of them, it's running on CPU 0 because this thing is getting migrated around as it's blocked and as other stuff could be running. In this case, nothing else is running, but the operating system is migrating stuff anyway, which might not have been in the picture in your head. Okay, so if we look at the beginning, this is actually the write. I screwed up and overwrote it with uh, <clears throat> what this thing is, which is a read, and this thing over here is a bottom half interrupt handler for... Rx for receiving from the from the network. So what's happening here is we're getting network interrupt, network interrupt, network interrupt, and the client. The, I'm sorry, the server program is doing read, 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 read of the of the data that just came in, and this read, for instance, returned a length of zero, but the reads back here were returning lengths that were on the order of 1,800 bytes. This is the megabyte coming across the network. Ah. Now you do the arithmetic, a megabyte per second, it's a gigabit per second uh, uh, network link in my desk at home, so it's around 100 megabytes per second, so a megabyte should take about 10 milliseconds to go across the wire. And you can, and if, you, if you zoomed around on this, you could see all 10 milliseconds of it going across the wire in pieces. You're not going to get more than 85 transactions per second because you're waiting on the network, it's all busy. Okay, however, there's more. Um, there's all these page faults after we finally get up and going. We get a megabyte. It's sitting in a kernel mode buffer. Actually, it's sitting in kernel mode buffers in chunks of about 18,000 bytes. This particular protocol for remote procedure calls, the receiving end re reads a header for a message that could be arbitrarily long, and the header says how long the rest is at which time this program malloc, in this case, a megabyte, actually one zero 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 bytes. And then as the data comes in, um, it ends up copying that into the allocated space, which is actually going to be a string in the map that's getting, that is the database. So there are 245 page faults in a row here, and that is one zero 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 divided by 4,096 rounded up. It's the right number of page faults for the length that's sent. It's also all wasted effort, and that's why this is so slow at the beginning. But it's the same game as the copy on right of zeros for allocated stuff. And there's some, some uh, timer interrupts in the middle. You'll notice these two timer interrupts, 
start sooner than that time interrupt. In fact, they start sooner by pretty much the length of the sine wave, which is 30, millisec 30 microseconds. It turns out on this particular processor, CPU cores 0 and 2 are two hyperthreads. There's only one physical processor core. And 1 and 3, 3 isn't shown, uh, are another hyperthread on the other of the two cores. And what you see here is the time interrupt comes in on a CPU core that's busy, no delay. This one comes in on a CPU core that, that, that a mile to the left, my left, um, went into deep sleep with an M-weight, and this is coming back out of deep sleep. So you can see from the transition measurements, you can absolutely confirm what the timing is for coming out of sleep. It turns out the Intel numbers as documented are off by a factor of 10. They said that the counts involved in this table in the Linux kernel were microseconds. They're tenths of microseconds, and I just proved it with this picture. Ah, so we've got sending a megabyte. Nothing to do about changing that other than buying a faster network. But if, if you want more than 85, that's the thing you do because now you, now you know that that's the bottleneck. Okay, the client takes about one and a half milliseconds. After finishing a write, I didn't show this here, but, but when the server sends back and you know, 10 bytes says I'm done, the next incoming network packet interrupt is about 1.5 milliseconds later. That means it took the client that long to get its act together to do the next request. So 1.5 milliseconds to do the next request. So you can conceivably could go figure out why the client's so slow and speed that up, or double buffer, you know, the usual things. You can all solve this problem now that you know what it is. Yes? Are you able to do, you know, data flow, temporal flow across machines? The process no. Machine yeah. Can you correlate these across machines? Absolutely. All of this stuff is, is mapped back into get time of day. And if you have two machines and you do get time of day on the two machines, you come pretty close. And I can explain how close. But if you then adjust the times to be within about a microsecond of each other, you can line up what, what the client did and what the server did in time perfectly. And you do that not by having fancy, expensive hardware. You do that by saying, oh, I sent this thing and it arrived over here and I sent this answer back and it arrived over there. And you get bounds on how far, on what the offset could possibly be between the two clocks on the two machines. And pretty soon you get some packets that aren't impeded in any way and just go and zoom and get there and, and you do short things like ping or whatever now and then and, or, or ACK and you get some really tight bounds. And then you do that early in a trace and do that late in a trace and you also then can calculate the slope of how the two clocks are drifting with respect to each other over the course of a minute or so. And then you line them up. Every, every, every year when I've taught about this, I have my students write that program because then they know they don't need to buy expensive hardware. So, and the final thing, of course, is all these page faults. And that's because of this malloc and free, malloc and free, malloc and free. And if you just had, if the, if the server allocated static buffers, perhaps reallocating until they're big enough, and then just reused it, you get rid of all that. And that's the one performance thing that's worth doing here. So there's more. Some of the transactions are three times faster than the others. Here's one transaction that takes uh, 1,400 microseconds. The very next one, the very next one, took 408 microseconds. And there's a bunch of the slow ones, and then there's some phase change, and then there's a bunch of fast ones, and then there's a phase change, and there's a bunch of slow ones. So we're back to why. So one of the things it can do when I'm reading the time at every transition, I can also read the number of instructions retired. And so you have a transition here, you have a transition here, you read the number, you read the cycle counter here, you read the cycle counter there, you subtract. You read the instructions retired here, you read the instructions retired there, you subtract, you divide, you get instructions per cycle. Not over the course of 10 seconds, over the course of three microseconds, or whatever this interval is that you're measuring. So these little triangles are displaying like a speedometer, they're displaying the instructions per cycle. Over here on pointing to the far left flat is zero instructions per cycle. And over here we don't have it in this picture, uh, if the triangle were pointing flat to the right, it would be four instructions per cycle. This is an Intel i3-4 issue machine. Straight up is one. Uh, diagonally up 
uh, northeast is two instructions per cycle, diagonally up northwest is half of instruction per cycle. So what we see here on the slow thing is the instructions per cycle is running about one-fourth of an instruction per cycle. One instruction every four cycles, sometimes uh, one instruction every two cycles. Down here at the bottom, what we see is it's running seven-eighths of an instruction to one instruction per cycle. Okay, so the reason it's slow is it's taking longer for every instruction. It's not waiting on something else. It's not... How can that happen? Oh. Yeah, so maybe uh, this guy's running with lots of cache interference or cache misses, and this guy's running with lots of cache hits. Um, if we look in the original trace, there actually um, might not be anything else running on, on the other CPUs disturbing the caches. So I don't actually have a good explanation for this, but the two choices are there's something good about the cache layout in the fast case. And these, these things are filling up a good chunk of the, of the L3 cache on this little processor. So maybe the operating system got to allocating the same physical pages every time after, you know, the hell with this uh, malloc free, malloc free. The operating system says, oh, you're it's always doing uh, the same 245 pages. I'll just give you the same pages every time. They, they're already in the cache by fluke. I don't think that's part of the design of allocating physical memory. But it would help. It helps by factor of three in this particular case. So these are all things that, that when you see them occurring in the code you care about, you know what to do about them. When you can't see them occurring, you have no idea. Quick question. When you're allocating memory, you're using memory that's even, I think, uh, gaining memory that's zero between the page first. Yeah, when you allocate memory, it's defined to be zeroed, not necessarily when you allocate it, but by the time you, you use it, in particular by the time you write to it. That's the whole point of this delayed yeah. until you, you get a page fault and then you do the copy on write. That's what all these page faults are doing. So why not block your uh, the buffer in, uh, in memory? Yeah, so the right answer to this, it was several slides back, is you, a better server design would allocate a buffer and reuse it. The cost of malloc and free isn't in the time you measured in the library routine for malloc and in the library routine for free in the user code, which is the measurement you always get if you profile and you say, I'm spending 5% of my time in malloc and free. That's wrong. The time is right after that when you do all these copy on writes that you can't see. That's where the time's really going. That's half of the time in this, stre in this stretch until it's all up and running. We have crappy tools in this industry to see what's really going on, and it does matter. So, example four. Ah, these are four, three programs running, each of which is beating to death uh, something like a 100 megabyte array. Uh, so it's sweeping through the L3 cache. It's always going out to main memory. And what we see, I picked three on purpose. So. Two of them have to be running on the same physical CPU core, in this case, one and three. And what we see, these are running as about five-eighths of an instruction per cycle. And this other one also simultaneously at about five-eighths of an instruction per cycle. So between them, they're getting a total of one and a quarter instructions out of that physical core. Over here on CPU 2, this is running with only three idle jobs contending against it. And it runs all by itself at uh, one instruction per cycle instead of five-eighths. So it doesn't quite hit the two that these two get. And in fact, what these two are doing, of course, is, is each of them is getting some more instructions done while the other one is waiting for the cache miss. That's the whole point of hyperthreading. So you get a little bit more than one CPU's worth of work out of two of these, each getting not half of a CPU, but, but somewhere between half and all of a CPU, depending on, on how many stall cycles there, there are. So that's the advantage you get. You get some. And, and then this thing runs all by itself. It runs fast. When it's running overlapped, it runs slower. Um, all by itself, it's actually running at one and a quarter instructions per cycle. And in the overlap case, it's running at one instruction per cycle. And here we have a partial overlap, and it's running at one, and then it speeds up when the other two stop. 
You can learn almost everything you ever wanted to learn about interference and hardware sharing just from looking at instructions per cycle. You don't need the other 39 different performance counters. But you need to look at a very fine time scale if you're going to correlate it with what the programs are doing and therefore what you need to fix. So here's one more example. This is uh, from the SkedgeFS. This is, again, the programs that simply scan through the, L the L2 cache. They don't go all the way out to main memory. And over here, this guy is running all by itself on CPU 2 and this one all by itself on CPU 3. This, the Linux scheduler is hyper-thread aware and puts these on different CPUs on purpose, different physical CPUs, when there's only two things running, rather than putting both on the same physical CPU and having it, having it work hard and the other one's doing nothing. So these are getting like uh, 1.75 instructions per cycle standalone, and then uh, these two here on, on 1 and 3 are the same core, and they're only getting uh, two instructions per cycle. Um, I got it the other way around. These are twos. These are 175s, and the 175s add up to 3.5. So between these two on, uh, on 1 and 3, running simultaneously on a single core, they are nearly completely burying the 10 cycles or so for the L1 cache miss that hits an L2. This is, in fact, very sophisticated hardware, and this is a cheap uh, $79 part. Okay, so that's what you get to see from instructions per cycle, and you get to see about all sorts of interference between programs. I mean, memory bush, caches, translation buffers, um, using the non-pipeline floating point divider heavily in two different programs, and they, they, they conflict with each other for 35 cycles. Um, translation buffer misses uh, microcode walks through the translation buffer. Um, you get to, all of the interference that there, that's there, you get to see in instructions per cycle dropping. And you get to see what's running on the other CPU, so you get to see why it's dropping. You can't do better than that. So here's a couple quick experimental examples, then I'll finish up and take questions. Um, a friend of mine, Drew, at Netflix, uh, took a couple days from the source code that I put in, in GitHub and ported it to a free BSD instead of Linux and ran it on one of the 32 core servers that Netflix, I guess they get it from Amazon and did a trace, and we were both amazed. Um, I actually spent some time consulting at a car company and uh, put this on a six-core ARM processor, and we got to see some anomalies. I, I don't have any of the original data, but I have the picture. Uh, this is two programs that are running on two different processors when a third thing starts up, and the first two that were out here now are swapping back and forth on CPU 2, Every three and a half microseconds, all they're doing is swapping back and forth. They're not making any progress. They're not making progress until they go back to this. That's running BSD? No, it's an older version of Linux. And they had no idea this dynamic was happening. Of course, of course the, the, the problem is this, this uh, 400 microsecond system call, which they then had to go deal with, but my, my job was to do the traces, create traces so we could all look at them. Um, and this is the beginning of that, just expanded out, and this is you know, three and a half microseconds, bam, 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 bam. This is just, you know, simple loop, and every time you go around the loop, do a sketch yield, and go around the loop, you do a sketch yield. And nobody thought to say, gee, maybe I should go around the loop 10 times and then do a sketch yield. And then, then the uh, switching would be, instead of every three and a half microseconds, every 35 microseconds. Can you go back to the FreeBSD case and talk more about what's going on here? I have no idea what else is going on there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I do know that this column here is timer interrupts. And, and further out in the trace, but I, I, I just picked a chunk further out, there's timer interrupts every mil microsecond, or every millisecond, yeah. Uh, but it's serving video traffic. This is a li live machine. And um, the, my friend at Tesla was driving when we took this trace. This is, this is the whole point of it's fast enough that it doesn't distort and you can use it for real instead of, oh, I can use it on my desktop running Valgrind for five days. No, this is just 
It's so fast, it's okay. So those are the contributions coming up. First, only tracing for several minutes of everything that's going on on all of the cores of machine can help you catch unpredictably slow things. If you know all of that transaction coming up is going to be slow, then you could do something simpler, but you don't know. <coughs> you just never know. Once you understand the mechanism that makes it slow, you can predict when it's going to happen again because now you understand it. All mysteries are simple once you know what they're doing. So, so tracing only works in situ for real-time traffic if its overhead is extremely small. 40 CPU cycles, 12 and a half nanoseconds per event, including the average cost of a cache miss out to main memory every 64 bytes worth of trace buffer, measured by having some program that does a million system calls and you run it with an uninstrumented kernel, you run it with an instrumented kernel with tracing turned off, you run it with an instrumented kernel with tracing turned on, you run it with an instrumented kernel with tracing turned on and instructions for cycle <coughs> turned on, and you count the times and you, you subtract and you say, ah, this is the overhead, the overhead of having the hooks compiled in but tracing turned off is negligible, could never measure it, zero. The overhead of the vanilla tracing is 12 and a half nanoseconds per event. But my budget was 50 nanoseconds. 50 nanoseconds for an event every five microseconds is 1%. Um, the version we built at Google was 50 nanoseconds. The version I built later for myself is four times faster. When you turn on the instructions per cycle, the overhead is three quarters of a percent because it's like 36 cycles to read the instructions per cycle counter because it's a microcode and they have all these various choices you can do. And then there's a 20 cycle divide. I did the divide on the fly in order to keep the size of the trace small, otherwise I'd have to keep both quotient and, and both numerator and denominator if I did the divide layer. Still, it's less than a microsecond. So there's three things that you can do. You can do execution, all, everything is going on. You can do waiting of keeping track when something gets unblocked, that's the key moment. You go look at what unblocked it. That's what it was waiting for, always. So if the disk interrupt handler unblocked it, it was waiting for disk. If it unblocked inside a futex, it was waiting for a lock. That's what futex does. And with a little extra work in the locking libraries in user code, if you have a company that uses common locking libraries across the whole company, you put in the extra ktrace call that says, here's which lock it is. And once you have that, then you have this thing and you can turn it into not only is it waiting for a lock, it's waiting for this lock. And the thing that freed the lock is in the trace. That's, that's the one, the other thread that did the make runnable in its locking library when it said, I'm done with this lock. Oh, there's somebody waiting on it. Wake them up. And of course, it's the, it's the thread that's holding the lock that you want to fix for performance. It's not the thread that's waiting. If you say, oh, this thread is waiting forever for locks, you don't fix that thread. You fix the one that's holding the lock way too long. And that's something you don't get from normal tools. OK, finally, there's this case of executing, but executing slowly. That's the interference case. Somebody else is sharing the disks or the networks or the memory bus or the caches or whatever, or the floating point divider. You get to see those purely from instructions per cycle. So the overhead I've told you, um, there's this philosophy that I feel strongly about is the nothing missing. I give, you, I give you a trace, I show you every nanosecond on every CPU core. It's not like, I once designed a, a disk server pro, a little machine at Google and I used uh, some accounting data that the company had about uh, how much time the disk server program took. And I undersized the hardware I built by, by 25% because I was unaware that the accounting data, it, is, it accounted for kernel execution on behalf of programs. So it wasn't that bad. But it, so if you got a, if, if, if there was a, a system call, it would get accounted for the program that did the system call. If there was an outbound network transmit, the transmit interrupt would get accounted for with the program. But incoming network 
interrupts. I didn't know which program they were for until after it was processed. You just said, oh, here's an interrupt. And somewhere in the TCP stack, much later, you figure out, oh, it's for that thread. They simply threw away all of the incoming interrupt pro network processing time. And it turned out, for a disk server program that's heavily loaded on a small machine, that was 25% of all of the CPU time was spent in interrupt handling for incoming packets. That's why I undersized it. If they had simply said, we don't know what this belongs to, here's the other bucket, and they put it in the other bucket, you could see, oh, other is 25%, we better pay attention. The assumption, of course, was other was negligible, we don't care. The way you figure that out is you have another bucket, you put the stuff in, you look to see how big it is. If it's negligible, great, you were right. If it's 25%, well, you've got some more work to do. So this is, uh, I've, I've built one implementation for Linux. I've, I've moved it to across a couple versions of Linux. It takes about half an hour to put the patches from one version into another version. Um, so we looked at Hello World. We looked at the scheduler dynamics. Uh, we looked at transactions. We looked at cross-program interference. All of that you can see from this one simple mechanism of all the transitions, nothing else. So the thing that's different about this is the only tool, at least the only one I know of, that it's fast enough you can run in situ with live traffic, both in the network traffic sense and in the road and airplane traffic sense. <coughs> uh, keeping track of the make runnable event turned out to be a key to understanding the interactions between threads. Um, adding the instructions for cycle turned out to be a key to understanding interference. It came from somebody asking me in a talk like this three years ago, so how come you can't tell us about cache interference? And I went off and thought about it and said, well, if I do instructions for cycle, I can. So I did that. Um, and the, uh, so the idea is that if you do a total trace of requests and things, you get the client side, the network, the server side, executing and waiting and executing slowly, then you can see exactly why something is slow. You can just read it off the timeline. No guesses. And then there's little user mode libraries you can put in, put in labels. And uh, I added the PC tracing last Friday. Found a latent bug yesterday. Um, and then there's this post-processing that produces all the stuff that you can, you can pan and zoom and you, you, you can take a, a two minute trace and zoom in to 10 nanosecond intervals across the screen. So, if anybody is interested in this, wanted to help out a bit, these are the kinds of things that I hope actually not to do, but hope to get someone else to do of other operating systems. And there's a few things to complete. And I, I would like to do a, an ARM port to a Raspberry Pi 4. I have the Raspberry Pi 4. That's as far as I've gotten so far. So, any other remaining questions, and then we'll be out of here. Yeah. Are there, in your KU Trace macro call, is, is there specialization depending upon where the kernel or the user is? No. Is, the, 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 it used to be two lines of code. Um, somebody in the kernel group uh, complained to me that that wasn't the right style for the kernel, so I turned it into a macro. The macro expansion is if KU Trace is on, then call this routine in the loadable module. That's the entire expansion. So that routine doesn't need to do anything unique, and it, what is it, there's no malicious process control? It just, puts, it just puts another four byte entry into the trace. Oh, the, the trace entries are four bytes. That's why it's fast. There's 12 bits of what event happened. That covers uh, 300 odd uh, system calls, 300 odd system returns, 300 odd 32-bit backwards compatibility system calls that are different, 32-bit 32 32 -bit returns, a uh, couple hundred interrupts, a couple hundred faults, a uh, context switch, a few other things like I'm a label, that's it. 12 bits of event number and 20 bits of timestamp. Timestamp is the cycle counter shifted over six bits, so it increments about every uh, 18 to 20 nanoseconds, and it wraps around every 18 to 20 milliseconds, 20 bits, a million. Okay, and, and so I, I depend on getting timer interrupts at least once per wraparound so that there's an event, so that everything of creating the high-order cycle counter bits is done in post-processing. 
No, the, the, the call that I had on the screen passes in the event number. It says, I'm doing a system call, and I ORed in the system call number. Yeah. Uh, I'll do four, and then we'll stop. Yeah. Uh, you record one uh, around parameter for the system call. Would more be more useful? Uh, more would be more useful, but it makes the trace bigger. I mean, if you, if you want more, you can use ftrace 30 times slower, and you can record all of the parameters, and you can, you can have runtime <coughs> decoding of which system call has five parameters and which has two. I wanted something I could run in a real data center during the busiest hour of the day with no slowdown. The, so the, what's stored in the trace is just the low order 16 bits of the first parameter. But that's really useful. It's good enough. It's an engineering balance. When I added the instructions for cycle, I, I had to add four bits to every entry, which I did with a parallel array of bytes because I didn't want to you know, make all the entries twice as big. Question? If I could only have four CPU performance counters, yeah. Uh, issue slots, so if a, a machine can issue four instructions per cycle, four times the number of cycles, and I mean the real cycles, not the constant cycles, depending on if, if, the, if the clock is slower, then there's fewer sets of four issue slots per second. If the clock is faster, there's more issue slots. So number of issue slots, just a free running counter keeps getting larger. Number of issue slots with instructions in them, the ones that don't have instructions in them are waiting on the iCache. They may be waiting on the iCache because it's a cache miss. They may be waiting on the iCache because there is a branch miss predict and it's going back to the front of the pipeline to go fetch or whatever, and it's six cycles away before you get to the uh, issue slot, but whatever. So issue slots that have instructions in them. Issue slots that have instructions in them that actually issue. If they don't issue, it means you're waiting on the back end uh, Typically, you're waiting on a back-end load or store unit that's, that's got 24 of them in front of you. But you could be waiting on the not pipeline floating point divide unit. But almost everything else in back-ends these days are fully pipeline. You can start a new one of whatever every cycle. So those don't wait until you get backed up in some way. Okay, and then the fourth one is instructions retired. Okay, with those four, you can subtract instructions retired from issue slots that actually issued. And the difference is speculative instructions that were thrown away. And sometimes that's a big number. And so you need to know. You can't assume, oh, that's trivial, forget it. You might find you're spending 30% of your program in that and you need to restructure your branching stuff a bit or you need to switch your algorithm a little bit so you're doing table lookups instead of if, 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 if. Okay, once you see speculative execution popping up as, as noticeable, you almost always can fix it in 20 minutes. Okay, so those are the four counters. It's really helpful to have a fifth thing, which is a free-running uh, 100 megahertz counter, just every 10 nanoseconds. Does not change based on the clock going faster or slower, battery saving, whatever. And it's the same for all the cores and nobody can write to it. It just keeps counting. Absolutely. And, and that to be read in one cycle, not 36 cycles. And to be read without having to set up these other control registers to say, the thing I want to look at is what time it is. You know? And by the way, when I do that, nobody else can, can do looking at some other counter. There's global state the way these things are now, which is terrible. I mean, when, when I run gathering IPCs, I take over the, the performance counters for the whole machine for whatever the multiplexer is that has instructions. None of the other choices are there. I just overwrite them in the kernel that says, okay, here's what I'm going to measure and to hell with everybody else, which is not a good design. Okay, the other thing is to have the performance counters, the four that I named, be per process, per thread, so that they are saved and restored at context switch time along with the other registers. I think of them, if you've got 16 registers, as four more registers. Save all 20, new thread, restore all 20. And they should be one cycle read. I thought the timestamp counter was free running. The timestamp counter is, is free running when you get a chip that has constant timestamp counter. <laughs> 
but nobody tells you what its frequency is. You have to go screw around in an operating specific system specific way to find out, oh, this is 3.6 gigahertz. On this other machine right next to it is 3.2 gigahertz. Okay, and, and, you, and you have to keep writing that code, you know, every time for every new version of every operating system. Sometimes you have to go read slash proc slash CPU info in ASCII and pull out some characters. It's crazy. If it were architected as just 100 megahertz, and everybody has 100 megahertz counter, that's the thing they're multiplying up to get 2.7 gigahertz, 2.8, 2.9. It's a 100 megahertz counter with a multiplier and a phase lock loop. I just want to count the 100 megahertz. No, you can't measure it reliably uh, because because it's constant. But you might be running uh, on a machine that's coming out of idle, and and uh, it's not actually running anywhere near that speed while you're measuring. And then you're off by a factor of two, or you get an interrupt in the middle. And you can screw around, and you can build routines that sort of more or less measure it. But that's crazy. You're just architecting a constant rate thing that everybody knows the the documented rate. I've got two more questions to do. Uh, so yeah. Thank you. A very purposeful design tool. And, but I was wondering if, I mean, if you're not just merely trying to understand timing anomalies and interference, but if you're also trying to determine why is my battery running out all the time, or why is my server never in turbo boost mode because it's always too hot? Uh -huh. you, um, yeah, so if you're concerned about battery time or uh, temperature variations and clock speed and stuff, yeah. um, uh, you, you could. You can use current tools to measure a lot of those things because they're, they're millisecond scales. I mean, when something gets hot, it doesn't get hot in a microsecond. It gets hot in tens of milliseconds. So there's no point having a carefully engineered, fast transition thing measuring it. You just need to have some user mode program that reads... If you wanted to really care about battery consumption, you would want to get the Apples and uh, Samsungs of the world to deliver better measurements by process ID of who the hell is using up the battery. But it only needs to be by process ID. It doesn't need to be by microsecond by microsecond. So last question. So I want to be clear. So you actually are programming the PMU counter to get things like instructions to tire and stuff like that? You have to program the PMU counter in order to get instructions to tire. There is no things like that. It's exactly that number. <laughs> it's a pain in the ass. And it's different on the, on the Ryzen's and on the i3. So you have to you have, to have the, the loadable module that does this has to have code in it. It says, you know, what processor am I on? It's crazy. Okay, I'm on. Um, thank you very much.